Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And with the auspicious occasion of Bhadra Purnama coming up tomorrow, I'll speak on the Srimad Bhagavatam and specifically I'll speak on the genius of the Srimad Bhagavatam in doing a particular thing that is of vital importance for every one of us in our life and that thing is the Bhagavatam can transform the intensity of distress into velocity in devotion I'll repeat this we all experience distress in life and some distresses are small, some distresses are great. So the Bhagavatam can transform the intensity of distress into velocity in devotion. The greater the distress that we experience, if we learn <coughs> to see the world in the way the Bhagavatam guides us to see, then that can help us to increase our velocity in devotion, to move faster towards Krishna. Distress is universal in the world. And <clears throat> I was talking recently with a Srila Prabhupada disciple who was born and brought up in America and then he came to India. Before he came to India, he had read a little bit about Eastern literature and he was struck, why does the Eastern literature keep saying that this world is a place of distress? Life is nice. But when he came to India, he said, when I saw the crowded locals in India, he said, yeah, world is really a distressful place. <laughs> So in many ways, the more we progress in science and technology, the more we do a cover-up job about the nature of the world. In fact, one contemporary thinker has said that technology is the art of arranging the world so that we don't experience the world. <laughs> that means it's very hot, but we arrange the world in such a way that we have air conditioning, so we don't feel the heat. It's very cold, we arrange heating in such a way that again we don't feel the cold. Now this itself is not bad. It's not that we are meant to torment ourselves. But if this rearrangement makes us deny the reality of the nature of the world, that is when it becomes a problem. So if now this when we say Distress is a uh, dis the world is a distressful place. This can seem very pessimistic. Why, why do you harp on negativity? There are good things in life also. People say, Kabi kushi, kabi gam. They say, Both come in life. Well, actually speaking, if you see in the overall run, as we grow old, as we get disease, as we eventually die, the distress is distress far far outweighs the happiness but it is not harping on the negative if there is a better life to be lived distress is a feature of the world the bhagavatam tells us but distress is not the purpose of the world distress is a feature of the world it is there in this world but it is not the purpose of the world. The example for this could be a hospital. In a hospital, distress is inevitable. Everybody is in distress. But the purpose of the hospital is not to cause distress. The hospital's purpose is to ease people's distress and eventually cure people. But a hospital is still a distressful place. It's a place which is filled with distress. And like I earlier said, technology 
uh, is itself not bad but what is the world view that is created by it if yes if it is too hot and we use a fan use air condition that's fine but if by that we start thinking oh that just by some technological adjustment we can become happy in this world then that is a misconception so when a patient is sick at that time treatment of the patient involves giving the patient both a curative medicine which is the central treatment and also some pain killing medicine so similarly even in the past there was material technology and there was attempted material improvement so material improvement is like the painkiller and spiritual improvement is like the curative medicine both are required both are required but in a proper balance if a patient start thinking of taking painkillers and start thinking oh i'll become happy i'll become healthy i don't need anything more then it is a problem the painkiller is not the problem it is thinking of the painkiller to be the cure that is the problem similarly technology is not the problem material progress is not the problem thinking that technology and material progress alone will solve our problems that is the problem and one of the big contrasts that we see in today's cultural propaganda and in the bhagavatam's world view the bhagavatam's world view is a elaboration of the bhagavad gita's world view the bhagavad gita tells us this world is dukkhalayam ashashvatam and if we see most of the media centers on entertainment a major part of entertainment is romance whether be it in uh, movies or novels or wherever else and most romantic novels or movies they center on the idea of happily ever after now the bhagavatam tells us the bhagavad gita tells us dukkhalayam ashashvata it's exactly opposite <laughs> dukkhalayam happily ever after ashashvata <laughs> <laughs> now <clears throat> while this world is a place of distress and we may think oh let's think positive we'll all be happy over here if you think of this world as a place of distress we just become more distressed that thinking is is it's good in some ways but it can sometimes be bad many times people talk about the power of positive thinking but sometimes positive thinking can have a negative power also how is that see i was in canada a few months ago and i was talking with a uh, <coughs> a devotee who is group psychotherapy and this devotee was telling i asked him psychotherapy is where you go and pour out your heart to someone and to to express your heart to one stranger is difficult enough but to express it to a group of strangers it's even more difficult so i wouldn't even do that so he told me that yes we have codes of confidentiality but but what happens when everybody pours out their heart and tells their problems is that people often because of their mind feel that i am facing so many problems the kind of problems i am facing no one else faces this kind of problems so when every people hear everybody else's problems then my god I, everybody is having problems <laughs> everybody is having problems so as i, as I travel across the world as i talk with people i can see that everybody has struggles whichever part of the world whatever level of financial prosperity whatever level of professional success people may have so few things make us as unhappy as the belief that everyone else is happy <laughs> few things make us as unhappy as the belief that everyone else is happy and today's culture is such that it makes us believe that everyone is happy because we see advertisements we see movies we see billboards 
filled with smiling faces, laughing faces. Now their faces are smiling, internally their hearts may be crying. But because of this propaganda, we suffer much more because we think we are suffering alone. And everybody else is happy, why am I suffering like this? So when the Bhagavatam says this world is a place of distress, that is not negative thinking. Rather imagining that this world is a happy place, that is a positive thinking that will have a negative effect. It is Now, now the point here is not that oh this world is a place of distress, let us all be distressful. That is not the point of the Bhagavatam. At the start of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna was crying. Tamtatha Kripaya Vishtam Ashru Pura Kulekshanam. He was crying. And Krishna did not tell Arjuna, Oh Arjuna, this world is Dukhale. Now we realize Dukhale, that's good. Let's end the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> no! Krishna gave him the message by which he could gain spiritual strength. And by that spiritual strength, he regained his composure. I will do your will, Arjuna told Krishna. And that's he regained his composure. So, just like a patient acknowledges that I am sick, I am in pain, but the doctor tells him there's a treatment. Now take this treatment and you will be on the path of recovery. And then the patient's, uh, patient's calmness is based not on denial of reality, but on finding a direction to deal with reality. Similarly, the Bhagavatam describes that this world is a place of distress. That is a foundational teaching of the Bhagavatam. But amid this distress, we can find the direction towards happiness that is beyond this distress. How does this happen? The Bhagavatam describes that there is the material world and beyond is the spiritual world. And the Bhagavatam says the wise people, Tasyaiva heto prayate takovilo, na labhyate brahmata muparyavda, tal labhyate dukhavalanyata sukham, kalena sarvatra gavira namasa. It says endeavor for that purposeful end which can't be achieved by anything in this world. In this world will get happiness and distress, happiness and distress, wherever we go. But arise beyond this world and attain that eternal destination which is filled with spiritual happiness. Material happiness will be followed by material distress. So don't endeavor for that. And how many, how many, many different characters across history and across geography Endeavored and grew spiritually is what the Bhagavatam's narrative is. So, I started by talking about how we can transform the intensity of distress into velocity in devotion. So, devotion is the treatment for our bhavaroga, for our disease of material existence. Nivritta tarshai rupagi yamanad. So the Bhagavatam, the start of the 10th canto says that for all of us who are suffering in material existence, the hearing of Krishna Katha is the Bhava Aushadi. It is the medicine for material existence. And who will not take it? If they understand that this medicine is so powerful and it works so universally and effectively. So the, therefore, the whole purpose of the Bhagavatam is to inspire us to take the medicine of Krishna Bhakti, of absorbing our consciousness in Krishna by which we can rise above the distress of the world. <coughs> so, Let's take at three different ways in which distress can come and how the distress is faced and countered by those characters. If you look at the world, distress can come because 
we may ourselves do some mistake. Sometimes say we invest our money somewhere and that stock crashes everywhere and we get into a lot of trouble. So we make some mistake and that causes us trouble. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it may be that we just make a small mistake but a big amount of trouble comes because of that. Now we speak one inconsiderate word and then 100 people seem to pounce on us. This is a small thing, why are you making such a big issue? So, that is one way our mistake may cause distress. Another is that when somebody does, somebody is on a mission against us. Somebody becomes our enemy and that person hurts us. There can be many ways in which distress can come, but we are just looking at broad patterns over here. And most difficult to digest is when we do something good and because of doing that good people trouble us or trouble comes upon us then it is most unbearable so let's look at three narratives in the Bhagavatam which illustrate these three different aspects of how distress comes and how the characters involved transform the distress the intensity of distress into velocity in devotion the first example is of Parikshit Maharaj. Parikshit Maharaj was a virtuous, devoted king. And under the pressure of circumstance, he had gone into a forest and he was hungry and thirsty. And he asked a sage for some water and the sage just didn't respond at all. And he just got annoyed. And in that annoyance, he just took a dead snake and put it on the on the neck of Shami Krishi. So it is just a, it is a sarcastic expression of annoyance. It was that, you didn't welcome me with a garland, I will see you off with a garland. And he put on a snake. And later on he realized, so that's not what I should have done. But it was under the pressure of the moment. But when that happened, what was the result of that? He was cursed to die in seven days. Now, um, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an indiscretion, it's an improper thing, but to have to die because of that, it's horrible. So, so normally, we function in the world in, with the implicit understanding of action, reaction, correlation. See, if I have done this, I should be getting this. If I study in my exam, I should get this many marks. I should get this many marks. If I work at my job, I should get this result. And yes, there is an action relation, action reaction correlation. But karma is not simply a linear chain of action A leading to reaction B. Actually, between action A and reaction B is also the whole combination of our past karma which plays out. So that's why I say three people are walking along a road. And they're talking and the road is slippery. Neither, none of them notices it's slippery. So now one of them slips and falls down. And it's embarrassing. Their whole clothes get dirty. Another one slips and falls. But there is a branch over it. They hold it and they steady themselves. The third one slips and falls. And there's a sharp stone behind. And their head hits against the stone. And they get a severe head fracture. Now the same action. You could say all three were inattentive. But three of them got entirely different troubles because of that, different magnitude of troubles. Why is that? Because the reactions to actions, when we may face a particular situation, it is not just because of the present action that we have done. The result that we do action A and we get the result B. But action A doesn't alone doesn't cause result B. Action A plus destiny. So, it all comes together to give the result. So, karma plus daiva plus kala leads to phala. So, sometimes we might do a small mistake and if our destiny is adverse, then a small mistake may lead to a big catastrophic result. Now, if we are honest, uh, then we will also recognize 
that there are times in our life when we have made big mistakes and we have not got much result also. <laughs> so it's not that destiny is unfair. In the long run, destiny works out in the balance. I was recently, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, something wrong here, Hare okay, okay, this is also destiny, <laughs> <laughs> this got switched off, okay, so, I was talking with a, a cricket player in India who is, just about to be selected nas at national level, he's also spiritually interested. So I was talking with him about destiny. And he, he, I explained the concept to him. He was very depressed because I was not getting selected, since I am performing so well. So then I explained about destiny, then he gave an interesting exam. He accepted this point and he said, he's a batsman. So he said that sometimes as a batsman, you are not out and you are declared out. But sometimes you are out and you are declared not out also. So overall destiny works out fairly. But what happens for Parikshit Maharaj, the small mistake, catastrophic reaction, curse to die. Now what does Parikshit Maharaj do at that time? He's, he's already a devotee, he's already a virtuous, responsible, dharmic king. But then he uses the distress as an impetus to intensify his devotion. He focuses wholeheartedly on practicing bhakti. On, he gives up everything else and becomes absorbed in hearing about Krishna. And when the sages assemble on hearing about his renunciation, he doesn't complain to the sages. Why did this happen to me? Instead, he ap appreciates and thanks the sages for being there with him for guiding him, for blessing him for his final journey. So, even if we can't be grateful for all situations, we can be grateful in all situations. Grateful for all situations means, oh, this has happened is so good. Well, sometimes bad things happen. And if suddenly, if our relationship goes down, uh, goes down the hill, if our health becomes, if we get a terrible disease, if we lose our job or whatever, these are bad things. It's not that somehow we have to imagine everything is good. Well, bad things do happen in life. Sometimes philosophy is oversimplified. There is a popular Gita Sar in India. It says, Jo hua wo achcha hua. Jo ho raha hai wo achcha ho raha hai. Jo hone wala hai wo bhi achcha hi hoga. Whatever happened is good, whatever is happening, happening is good, whatever will happen will be good. Now, you know, I have read the Gita hundreds of times, there is no verse like this in the Gita. <laughs> Absolutely no verse. Now, now, the point is, when say Draupadi is dishonored, nobody comes and tells her, Joh hua hua hua. It's a bad thing. So bad things do happen in life. But the important thing is, if we keep looking at the bad thing, then we will simply feel bad. So we can't be grateful for all situations. But we can be grateful in all situations. That in this situation, this bad thing has happened, but I have got something good by which I can deal with this bad situation. So I've got a terrible disease, but I've got health insurance. I've got a supportive family. I've got a supportive community. Uh, I can take this disease is curable. So I can be thankful for those things. So what Parikshit Maharaj demonstrates is that instead of resenting, why did this bad thing happen to me? Why did this curse come upon, come upon me? He says, he's grateful for all the sages coming there to bless him so that he can remember Krishna. And thus, he intensifies his devotion. He becomes wholeheartedly absorbed in Krishna. Naishadati dustakshanma Parishit Maharaj takes what is known as Prayavrata. Prayavrata is the vow of fasting till death. 
and some, for somebody who that becomes inevitable, is the side. No, no need to maintain this body. Is focus on preparing for death. So he prepares this by absorbing himself and hearing about Krishna. And he says, Oh Shukdeva Goswami, don't think that I need a break. Don't think that I am in trouble because of not getting food or water. So it's very significant that that same Parikshit Maharaj, who is so afflicted by thirst, that he unintentionally offended a Brahmana. But now, by the grace of another Brahmana, Shukde Goswami, he was getting Harikatha. And then, he no longer felt that torment. He says, I am relishing Harikatha so much, that I don't feel, I don't feel any pain. I don't feel the torment of hunger, the torment of thirst. <clears throat> Actually, we experience pain based on where our consciousness is. So wherever our consciousness is, that is where we experience all our emotions in relationship with. <clears throat> Say, now, just I think today India-Pakistan match is going on or it got over. So, a few months ago there was this Champions Trophy in which India was expected to win final and India lost very badly. So after that one boy in India was telling me, at three nights I could not sleep. <laughs> I said, how could India lose like this? So I told him, hey, those cricketers probably went to sleep, I couldn't lose sleep. <laughs> so what happened was, he was in India, the match was in England. But because his of attachment, the consciousness was caught over there. So that's why, where our consciousness is, we experience emotions accordingly. So what the Bhagavatam did for Parishit Maharaj was that it raised his consciousness above his body towards Krishna. So at the body level, there was a sense of deprivation. But that did not affect him so much. Because he was not in bodily consciousness. He was, his consciousness focused on Krishna. So even if he was aware, it was not that he was unaware that I was not drinking, I am not eating. That awareness was there, but that was not the focus of his awareness. So that was a part of his awareness. So similarly, we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. With pain means pain is a part of our life. But if we keep thinking about that particular thing, why did this happen? Why is it like this? Why is this person behaving like this? If, we, if our consciousness gets caught in that, then we will live in pain. But if our consciousness is rising to something bigger, then we may live, the pain will still be there, but because our consciousness is focused elsewhere, we won't feel that much pain. So what the Bhagavatam does is, helps us become attached to Krishna. The Bhagavatam helps us to become devoted to Krishna, to have our consciousness directed and attached towards Krishna. And then, even if painful stimuli come, we can learn to tolerate them. We won't get overwhelmed by them. The second story, which it discusses about how somebody else may cause trouble to us. The first is where our own mistake gets us into trouble. <clears throat> now the second is the story of Gajendra. Gajendra was a was a powerful elephant, in fact the most powerful among a herd of powerful elephants, the king of elephants, as the very name Gaja Indra means, Gaja is elephant, Indra is the king of elephants. So now he had gone to have an enjoyable time in a, in a lake, in a river and there he was enjoying and suddenly out of nowhere a crocodile came and caught him. And the crocodile caught him. And he thought, what is this crocodile? I'll just knock it off. He tried to knock it off. And it just wouldn't go away. So held on and on and on and on. He was fighting, fighting, fighting. Just couldn't. Sometimes a problem comes in our life. And we think, I'll just deal with this. No problem. And then sometimes that we find that, that this problem is just not going away. I thought I'll deal with it. Just staying on and becoming worse and worse and worse. And at that time, no 
nobody helped him also. Hey, other elephants were there, his family was there, but nobody could come to help him. And his crocodile was just holding on and squeezing his leg and squeezing his life out with the leg. Just pick, uh, through, through its grip on the leg. So he started losing energy, he started losing hope. And then what did he do? He actually, with his trunk, picked up a flower, picked up a lotus flower. And Narayana Khilaguru Bhagavan Namaste. He offered that flower to Narayana. Kuchira. He was in great distress, but somehow he offered that flower. And then he called out to Narayana, please come, please help me. And he prayed to Narayana to help him. Lord Vishnu came on Garuda and he released him from that pain. He couldn't do it himself. But when he called out to Krishna, Krishna came at that time. Now, herein, actually, if you see Gajendra's consciousness, Gajendra initially he starts praying because he's in such distress and he wants relief from distress. But then, as he keeps praying to Krishna, as his thoughts become more and more spiritual, then he starts realizing that I am so worried, I am so distressed that I am caught by this uh, crocodile, but actually I am caught in this crocodile-like material existence. And he says, Jiji vishe naham iha muyakin. He says, my dear Lord, that I do not I do not want to continue living in this material world. He says, Kalena Nesnaya That that ignorance, Agnya, that ignorance which cannot be destroyed even by the passage of time. You Lord, what I want is, you please destroy that ignorance for me. Sometimes distress may bring us to Krishna. And it's good, whatever way we come to Krishna. But, if we are open to Krishna's wisdom in our hearts, then Krishna will give us not just relief, He will not just release us from that particular distress, but He can release us from the generic distress of material existence itself. So there are many times across religious history when people in danger pray to God and God sometimes miraculously helps. But then, after getting the help from God, they go on with their normal life. Oh God, please help me. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> so for Gajendra, his story comes in the pages of the Bhagavatam, not just because Krishna intervened. Sometimes we feel that I pray to Krishna, there is no miraculous intervention. Krishna doesn't come like it came for Gajendra. So what is the use? Actually, the real miracle in that story is not Krishna's coming and saving Gajendra. The real miracle is the change in Gajendra's consciousness. Gajendra's consciousness initially was, save me from this crocodile. But just by the by his praying to Krishna, what happened? That connection with Krishna through prayer changed his consciousness. And he felt, Krishna, I just want release from this material existence. I just want to serve you. I just want to be devoted to you. And thus, he was delivered not only from the crocodile, but also from material existence itself. So for us, when we face problems because of some particular person, so it's interesting, when Gajendra is praying to Vishnu, he doesn't pray specifically, Gajendra, oh please kill this crocodile. <laughs> he doesn't pray like that. Please release me from material existence. Please release me from material illusion. So sometimes when some people trouble us and it happens that that, that person is doing so, we are trying to be reasonable, but that person is troubling us so much. It may be uh, it may be a colleague, it may be some relative, it may be a, a boss. So, so many different people can trouble us sometimes. It may be a neighbor. And then what happens at that time is 
our consciousness gets locked in that person. Oh, why is this person doing like this? And we feel that that person is the cause of my trouble. It, 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 it is circumstantial, but it is not ultimately. Whatever way people are acting, it's ultimately our own karma coming to us. Now, that doesn't mean that we passively tolerate anything and everything that everyone does. But it's that our actions should be determined by our principles, not others' actions. Our actions, okay, this person is doing like this, how do I respond right now? You did like this, so I do like this. If we act that way, then what is the difference between somebody who is spiritually minded and somebody who is materially minded? You did this to me, so I'll do this to you. And, so, and across the world, even when I talk with people who are new to bhakti or not practicing bhakti or even people practicing bhakti, so much emotional energy and time goes in getting even. You did like this, so I will do like this. Actually, our purpose in life, is, our purpose in this world is not to get even. Our purpose is to get out. <laughs> so, sometimes, now of course when somebody is hurting us, we may, have, we may have to do the necessary to protect ourselves. And that may mean taking some disciplinary action against them. Or at least creating some safety wall between us and them. That is fine. But we shouldn't let that person dominate our consciousness. This person is the cause of my problem. Yes, that person is maybe causing me problems, but my life is my life. My future is my future. No one deserves the right to monopolize my life and my future. Is that person maybe sometimes just unavoidably there in our life. But still, we rather than letting our consciousness become obsessed with that person, can say, okay. Krishna in this situation, how can I serve you? How can I move forward? And sometimes some people, uh, we may, we, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita uses a vision that, that there is a materialistic worldview in which we think that we relate with people for our material gratification. You know, okay, I'll do something, this person please me, and I'll do, some, uh, the, I'll do something for that person, that person will do something for me, and we'll please each other, we'll enjoy each other together. So we think we are together for material gratification. But the Bhagavatam tells us that actually we are here together for our spiritual evolution. Now, that means whoever is present in our life, they are there in a way that will help us to grow. So if we are here and we are meant to go towards Krishna, some people take our hand and lead us towards Krishna. Some people may kick us from behind towards Krishna. <laughs> but when they kick us from behind and we turn and try to kick them back, <laughs> then we just stay over there. So uh, it said that some people bring happiness wherever they go. And some people bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> so, either way, there are different people who are going to act in different ways. And if we see, instead of seeing, why is this person acting like this? We focus on Krishna. Krishna, how can I serve you in this situation? How can I serve you in this situation? Then Krishna will guide us way ahead of this. Eventually, no relationship in this world is permanent. That is a cause of distress if that relationship is joyful. But that is also a cause of relief if that relationship is painful. So, we can just, if we focus on Krishna and think how best I can serve Krishna, then even if there is some difficult person in our life, we won't let that person monopolize our consciousness. You are there, that person, I will deal with whatever way I can deal with this person. But I will focus on moving towards Krishna. And that is what Gajendra does. And the last is where what we do, when we do something right, something good, and that gets us into trouble. That 
is most unbearable and that is what happens with Prahlad Maharaj Prahlad is a five year old boy and he is a wonderful devotee of Vishnu and it is because of his devotion that his father becomes his enemy and his father is on a mission to harass, torment and assassinate him and all that Prahlad had to do at that time was give up his devotion and Hiranyakashipu would have given up his animosity so it's difficult enough when we face difficulties that we know we deserve I did wrong so I deserve this difficulty but it's even more difficult to face difficulties that we don't deserve I am doing good why are you why are you troubling me why is life troubling me like this so Prahlad could just have said I give up but Prahlad did not do that and the same theme actually is resonate, repeated in the most intimate and elevated pastime of Krishna with the gopis. The gopis give up everything for Krishna and it is their devotion to Krishna, there is a longing for going towards Krishna that makes all their family members criticize them. What are you doing? How can you go like this? Leave every your responsibility and go towards Krishna. And then they go towards Krishna and then just as about they are, to, they are about to perform the Rasalila, Krishna leaves them. So it seems that if they had not gone out, their family members would not be unhappy. They had not gone out, they would not be left alone in the forest homes. So it can, it can appear as if it was their devotion that is the cause of distress. However, it is not devotion that is the cause of distress. Later on, when Krishna reappears before the gopis, at that time, the gopis are at one level very delighted that Krishna has come back. But at another level, they are also angry. How could you have left us and gone away? You know, suppose you have a child who is naughty, and the child runs away from home. And then, after great difficulty, you find that child. And the child has come back now. You are happy that the child has come back. At the same time, you are angry. How dare you run away like this? But at the same time, you are afraid if you shout too much at the child, the child may run away again. <laughs> so, you don't know how exactly to act at that time. <laughs> so, the gopis are like that. So, the gopis indirectly tell Krishna, that Krishna, there are some people, if you love them, they love you back. There are some people, uh, you love them, uh, even if you don't love them, they love you. And there are some people, even if you love them, they don't love you. So, he says, can you explain these the different kind of lovers? So indirectly, what they are saying, Krishna, we were loving you, why did you love us? So, are you in this third category? So they don't tell Krishna directly, that how could you do like this? But indirectly, that's what they are saying to Krishna. So at that time, Krishna replies in a very beautiful passage in the Bhagavatam and he says <clears throat> one, suppose a person is poor and that person becomes wealthy and then that person loses that wealth then the, the craving for that wealth the anxiety how will I get this wealth that will be enormous so if, if we don't have something that is craving, if somebody is poor and they are more or less settled that this is my lot in life, then even if they see a lot of wealth, they okay, those people have wealth I don't have, they just accept it. Somebody who is born wealthy and stays wealthy, they take the wealth for granted. They want it, but they are not craving for it. So it's like say a, a cricket match is going on and one team is comfortably winning then there is not much excitement or emotion in that match and Savan team is hopelessly losing then also there is not much emotion <laughs> but the team is losing and suddenly one player plays very well turns the whole match around and they come just close to winning and then that player gets out <laughs> and then now they are about to lose so what happens when 
from loss to gain to loss happens then the emotional intensity becomes much more so krishna says to the gopis that you did not have my association i called you you came you had my association and i disappeared from you and i did this simply to intensify your devotion for me so krishna says that don't think that i am not reciprocating with you actually i am reciprocating with you in a way that will intensify your devotion so prahlad was already a great devotee no doubt but when his entire world turned against him that is the time when his devotion became manifest even more it became celebrated and the lord arranged the past time in such a way that prahlad alone was standing up to the atrocities of hiranyakashipu even prahlad's guru narad muni he said that he also was offering deferentially respects to hiranyakashipu not that he was worshiping him but he just decided that this is not my battle to fight so everybody else was bowing down to hiranyakashipu but he alone stood up and in this way his devotion became internally deepened and externally glorified so it was it may seem that his devotion was only it only increases trouble but actually it is not that devotion increases trouble it was rather the trouble increased his devotion is the difference between the two it may appear as if prahlad's devotion increased his trouble but it is actually the trouble that increased his devotion because that made him more and more determined to somehow or other stay devoted to the service of krishna similarly for if we look at the example of shri prabhupad he tried his best he got instruction from his spiritual master to share krishna message across the world uh, krishna message and from the time he got it he was a grahastha he had a family responsibilities with that he tried as much as he could to share krishna bhakti he tried for 40 years from 1922 to 1965 and just nobody was reciprocating nobody at all the people in india at that time were interested in piety not in spirituality so they were interested in serious spiritual practice it's a, and he found his own god brothers were caught in petty internal struggles they were not interested in expanding the mission and then he decided to go to america all alone at the age of 69 and it is actually his troubles became much more he was going, he go came to america you know on the way he had sea sickness then when the sea sickness settled that he got two devastating heart attacks somehow he survived that he came to america he was staying in butler pennsylvania but there he was treated not like a spiritual teacher but like a curiosity object they wanted oh this swami from india they just came more to see him than to hear him they see him and go away then he came to new york and he was all alone there and the janitor of the of the place he was staying that person stole his tip his typewriter then finally he came to lower east side in new york where he had his own place he was staying and he had his own program going on and the person who looked as if he would become his first western follower and disciple that person went mad because of uh, because of going high on drugs and came to attack prabhupad and prabhupad was 69 year old man saying he was young mad person i was uh, this one devotee who is working with people who are uh, who are drug addicts to rehabilitate them so he said that when people go high on drugs to restrain them sometimes it requires 5 10 people because that craving that madness gives this person a uh, energy that is overpowering so prabhupada was all alone against this person prabhupada has to flee from there because for prabhupada who had been 
a respectable sadhu in india who had been a well well reviewed author in india who had been a person who had met the prime minister of india who had corresponded and met the president of india who had a standing invitation who could go any time because of the pious culture of india to meet any vip that person was on the streets of america all alone with no money with no home as homeless as the hippies who were all around him and all this trouble we could say was because of his devotion if he had not tried to follow his spiritual master's instruction he would have been peacefully happily chanting hari krishna in vrinda it's not that he would have been maya he would have been my devotion only but he had come here because he wanted to serve his spiritual master so actually it might appear as if his devotion caused trouble but what happened through that trouble through it all krishna had a bigger plan and krishna revealed to the world through all the troubles that prabhupad went how prabhupad single handedly worked to inspire followers and through those followers he created a mission that now is spread all over the world prabhupad himself established 108 temples now we have our 600 temples prabhupad <coughs> wrote over 70 books and now they are distributed millions and millions of copies across the world and one of prabhupada's most prominent gift that he gave us was the shrimad bhagavatam for his shrimad bhagavatam he considered that as his magnum opus as the biggest contribution of his life and why prabhupada spoke about krishna all day to the people who came to meet him and prabhupad spoke about krishna all night to the people who didn't come to meet him that was by writing books so through his books he is available for us and through his bhagavatam he is giving us is demonstrating through his life and he is illuminating through his purports this principle that the distress of this world is not pointless the distress of this world is not meant to make us distressed the distress of the world is meant to make us devoted and if we become devoted the distress will come the distress will go but the devotion will stay so that vision the distress is not meant to make us distressed but it is meant to make us devoted that vision we get through the bhagavat both through the book bhagavat and the person bhagavat and when in our life when we are practicing bhakti when we are trying to do some, do some service and the nature of the world is that even when we are trying to do some diligent service we sincerely diligently in uh, devotedly are trying to do some service but somehow the nature of the world is that some people will be unhappy with us and even devotees will be unhappy with what service we are doing and then at that time if why am i doing this why should i do this at all and we have to see that it is not that devotion that is causing us trouble it is that that through that trouble our devotion will deepen rather than becoming discouraged you can see that this is simply the eternal principle of the world that is operating we stay determined humbly but firmly determined in our service to krishna and eventually whatever difficulties are there they will become catalysts for our devotion and then gradually those difficulties will in their own time go away so the distress will never stay but the devotion will stay forever that is the lesson of the bhagavad the bhagavatam concludes with at one level parikshit maharaj he he dies if we have a novel or if we have a movie or something adventure movie you know, that this hero has to find this this treasure within 7 days and if that treasure is not found the hero will die and that hero fights against this trouble that trouble and goes to the treasure and then If I suppose we watch the whole movie and at the end of the movie the hero dies. <laughs> hey, what is this? 
This also doesn't make any sense. So the Bhagavatam begins with Parikshit Maharaj curse to die and at the end of the Bhagavatam Parikshit dies. What happened? But actually Parikshit Maharaj doesn't die. In fact, Parikshit Maharaj raises his consciousness to live forever at the spiritual level. In fact, the Acharyas describe that when the snake Takshak comes to comes and bites Parikshit, it is not that Parikshit Maharaj died at that time. Yes, his body erupted in flames, but Parikshit Maharaj, by his absorption, Krishna had already attained Krishna. So the ultimate success in life is beyond this world. So even if there seems to be ultimate failure at the material level, still there can be success at the spiritual level. And of course, the Bhagavatam also demonstrates how there can be for the devotee success even at this level. Prahalad was redeemed and Prahalad was ruled, ruled as the king. The gopis were reunited with Krishna. Gajendra was delivered even in our vision. So sometimes the success may come at the a level where we can see with our eyes. But even if the success doesn't come at the level we can see, but the success is always there. So that Bhagavatam demonstrates the supreme potency of devotion to give us relief amidst distress. While the distress is there, by our absorption in Krishna, and to ultimately give us release from distress, to take us beyond this world, to the eternal world of Krishna. That's why the Bhagavatam itself, one of the concluding verses states that if you understand this message, then yad rasamrutvaptasya na anyatra syadruti kvachit. That once we understand how the Bhagavatam speaks to us, how the Bhagavatam manifests Krishna's love for us, how the Bhagavatam enriches and empowers us wherever we are in our life, then we will feel this is what I want to relish. There is no need for tasting anything else. This is so relishable. This is so enriching. This is so empowering. This is what I want in my life. Such is the glory of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And the Srimad Bhagavatam is the gift of Shukdev Goswami to the world. This gift of the great Bhakti teachers throughout history. And is a gift of Srila Prabhupada to all of us. It can be a gift that we give to ourselves by resolving to study the Bhagavatam. It is a gift that we can give to others by giving them an opportunity to study the Bhagavatam. By gifting them the Bhagavatam. It is a gift that we can give to others by sharing the message of Bhagavatam with others. And it is a gift that we can give to others most foundationally by trying to live the message of the Bhagavatam. That amidst distress, Rather than becoming distressed, if we become devoted, then people will say, oh, how is this person so composed, so absorbed, even if it's a distress, there must be something special in this person has. And that, that what that special is, is, is Krishna Bhakti. And that can attract people to Krishna Bhakti. So by reading the Bhagavatam, by hearing the Bhagavatam, by reading the Bhagavatam, by sharing the Bhagavatam, and by living the Bhagavatam, all of us can enrich ourselves with the Bhagavatam and enrich others with the Bhagavatam. I'll summarize. I spoke about how the Bhagavatam transforms the intensity of distress into velocity in devotion. And I started by talking about how distress is a feature of the world but it is not a purpose of the world. Like a hospital where Distress is there, but the hospital is meant to treat. And the treatment involves pain-killing medicine as well as curative medicine. So material progress and technology, it can mitigate problems at a material level. But if it creates the illusion that we can be happy in this world, then it is a big problem. Few things make us as unhappy as the belief that everyone else is happy. So when we understand, yes, everybody has their problems, distresses, then we can see our distress in perspective and focus on living the best life that we can. And then I talked about how the Bhagavatam's message is ultimately positive. It is not 
harping on the distressful nature of this world is not negative because <coughs> it by meditating on that if we can by acknowledging our disease if it inspires us to take the cure then that is positive i talked about three kinds of distress one is because of us because of our own small mistake we get into big trouble like parikshit maharaj small in a small violation of etiquette and curse to die but rather than resenting his fate he was he appreciated the sages who came to bless him as he tried to focus on remembering krishna so even if he can't be grateful in all uh, for all situations we can be grateful in all situations but amidst distress we can look for the things that are helping us to cope with the distress to overcome the distress and talk about how our we experience emotions based on where our consciousness is so the bhagavatam helps us to focus our consciousness on krishna and thus even if pain remains pain is a part of our consciousness not the whole of our consciousness we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain and then second i talked about how others cause us trouble like the crocodile caused trouble for gachendra and he sought relief from the crocodile initially but then as he was praying to krishna his consciousness evolved and then he sought release from material existence itself so even if a person is troubling us we don't have to give that person the right to monopolize our consciousness or to obstruct our devotional journey towards krishna we do the needful to deal with that person we focus on krishna how can i serve you in this situation if we see that the people around us are for our material gratification then when they don't provide gratification but instead they cause frustration it will be intolerable and pointless but if we see the people around us are there for our spiritual evolution then we will focus on how we can evolve some people lead us lovingly towards krishna by taking us by the hand and some people may kick us from behind and they will push us towards krishna but both are playing a role which is for our spiritual growth and lastly i talked about if we do the right thing and that gets us into trouble is most unbearable prahla the only cause of his trouble was his devotion to krishna so it may it appeared externally that this devotion caused trouble but actually the trouble caused devotion why so krishna told the gopis that when i left you it was not because i rejected your devotion but because i want i intensified your devotion person who never has wealth or who always has wealth they not so emotionally involved with wealth person who has wealth loses it and then gains uh, has a uh, person who has no wealth gains it and then loses it they their emotions are much more involved so similarly for us when we try to practice bhakti and when we practice bhakti and we feel enriched and then our bhakti itself seems to be causing us trouble at that time we realize the value of bhakti much more and we focus on the core aspect of bhakti by that not on the peripherals that seem to be causing us trouble and thus our devotion deepens so when we ashla prabhupad when he was alone on the streets of new york be chased by a person who was a prospective disi- disciple but had become a drug maniac now his trouble seemed to be because of his devotion but through it krishna revealed his extraordinary devotion to the world and eventually prabhupad created a legacy of bhakti for the whole world to relish so for us when other people seem to be creating trouble to us because of our devotion because of our desire to serve krishna then rather than obsessing on those people we can see that these people whatever be their role in our life if we focus on serving krishna through it our bhakti will grow and thus the bhagavatam reveals that there is sometimes success at the material level as happened with gajendra and the gopis and <coughs> prahlad and sometimes there may be no success at the material level as happened with prahlad parikshit but still there was success at the spiritual level 
but if we are devoted some if we get relief from distress in this world but even if we don't get it we will get release from distress beyond this world so the the, the distress will never stay forever the devotion will always stay forever that is the eternal enriching benediction that the bhagavatam can offer to us and if we see our distress in life as an impetus to become devoted not distress then we can relish the bhagavatam we can share the bhagavatam we can live the bhagavatam and we can enrich our and others lives with the bhagavatam thank you very much kantra shrimad bhagavatam ki Do we have time for questions or is late? Yes, please. Any questions? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. And uh, the last time I heard you was our another program and it's gone to and it was my good fortune to hear you again. Uh, I just have one question from you that we were talking about distress and how. you know devotional service or the velocity of devotion actually increases because of the intensity of our distress but uh, my question is that sometimes and you give example of prahlad maharaj at, for the last a uh, point that you discussed but um i i am not prahlad maharaj and like the most fallen soul ever so if sometimes while going ahead in devotional service we face uh, material deprivations and that cause neglect of devotional service or that seem to be like a uh, discouragement towards devotional service and at that point of time what kind of consciousness should we like should i be mean, okay yeah good to be place so that yeah. i can You, you know, apply that statement that the intensity would be less. So, if material deprivation makes us discouraged in devotional service, uh, then how can we, at that time, uh, try to intensify our devotion? Yes, but at a practical level, we do need material things, and say, if we don't have financial security, if we don't have relational stability. if we don't have basic health it becomes difficult to practice bhakti and that's why in general bhakti can be started from any guna rajas tamas sattva but bhakti can be best practiced in sattva so we need uh, we need to try to create a situation of a relational financial medical stability by which we can practice bhakti yukta ahar viharasi chishta se karmasu yukta swapna va bodhasya yogo bhavati dukha that when we are regulated in our worldly activities then the practice of devotion of yoga can lead us to this freedom from distress so we are not talking here about intentionally embracing distress or thinking of distress itself as a virtue the virtue is devotion what we are talking about if distress comes on its own accord we don't give up our devotion so we work like at the pain killer is also important if i am in pain the doctor says i just give the curative medicine no pain killer the pain may be so unbearable that even if the cure is working the cure may take a long time to work and the patient may be in agony during that time the patient may become disheartened demoralized and the patient may even become suicidal because of the pain so we we understand that we are meant to serve krishna but we don't divorce the spiritual from the mental the physical the relational the social the financial we, if you have to see devotion not as a isolated activity but as an integrated activity that means it's not that coming to the temple and chanting hari krishna is bhakti it's doing our family responsibilities uh, well in the mood of service to krishna that is also bhakti doing our job well that is also bhakti taking care of our health if we our life is meant to serve krishna 
then what we do to take care of health is also bhakti. So if at a particular time in our life, a particular need is become dominant, say if somebody's health has collapsed, and then at that time, these can't come to the temple, these have to work on taking care of their health. Now, they don't have to say that, oh, this health is uh, taking care of my health is interfering with my devotion. Can say that taking care, if I'm taking care of my health in a mood of service to Krishna, mood that, okay, once my health becomes better, I can do more service to Krishna. Now, we don't give up our service to Krishna at that time. But we may not be able to do the service to Krishna in the same form or with the same magnitude as we would when we are healthy. So circumstances when they change, our, our purpose of serving Krishna doesn't change. But the way in which we serve Krishna, that will change. When Prabhupada was in Allahabad, at that time he, he had a pharmacy. So there was a, a doctor who would work with him. The doctor had a dispensary. The doctor would dispense the medicine, prescribe the medicine and Prabhupada would provide the medicine. So Satsurupaha introduced the doctor that comes in Lilamrath. And he says, it was clear that, uh, that Abhay Babu, he was called Abhay at that time, Abhay Babu was a very deeply religious man. But at that time, his main concern was, how can I earn more money? That's what was required for him at that time. So he was, of course, very we got an opportunity to talk about Krishna. At that time, that was his focus. So we don't have to see our material life as divorced from our spiritual life. Our material life is also necessary as a stable platform by which you can practice spiritual life. And if sometimes, in some situations, the material life requires more attention, we give that. And we don't give up our devotion, but it's, it's natural that when a particular thing requires more attention, we give that attention. If at that time we have devotees who are understanding, devotees who have gone through similar situations in their lives and then they can tell us okay in this situation we focus on this but even in this situation you can do this 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 even if you can't do all this you can do this so sometimes we may have a very static understanding of devotion and only if you're doing this 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 you are a devotee otherwise you've fallen down <laughs> no it's not like that sometimes in some situation certain activities may not be possible so we need some devotees who are understanding enough that okay, I cannot do this in this situation. But okay, so that doesn't mean, so we don't have to see devotion as like a digital logic one or zero. It's more of analog. There are times in which we can do more directly devotional activities. There are times when we cannot do those directly devotional activities. As long as we maintain the intent to serve Krishna. And we keep doing some devotional activities. So what we can do in our situation is for us to find by our intelligence and by wise association. The Ganga always keeps moving towards the ocean. But the Ganga doesn't always move by the same path towards the ocean. Sometimes when that path gets blocked, the Ganga has to find okay, this way, this way, this way, this way. So our consciousness is like the Ganga. We want it to go towards the ocean. But sometimes we are, say if we are in a place where there is a temple and we can come to the temple regularly, we can hear, we can take darshan, we can do kirtan. That's how we can move towards Krishna. But suppose our job, our family situation goes, makes us take us somewhere away from devotee association. Then we cannot do the bhakti in the same way. So the, that doesn't, the Ganga cannot flow by the same path. But that doesn't mean it can't flow, you can find some other path. Nowadays through online we can hear classes, we can get in touch with devotees through through online connections, we can we can maybe create our own association over there by by sharing Krishna Bhakti over there. Or we can say that this is the time when I can study Shastra more. Whatever it is, if we have the intent to serve Krishna, Krishna will reveal to us how to serve him in that situation. So we don't have to consider material deprivation as an obstacle in our devotion. It can be an obstacle in the practice of particular forms of devotion and we can work at a practical level to deal with the material obstacle as much as we can so that the material deprivation is ends but we don't have to 
uh, let that material deprivation dominate our consciousness. This is, a, I'll conclude with this point that when we are facing a problem, there are two unhealthy approaches. One is we think that Krishna will solve this problem and I'll not do anything. Say, if we have lost a job, you just come to the temple and chant Hare Krishna. Krishna will arrange a job for me. <laughs> well, no, you also have to work to get a job. But, so not thinking about the problem at all is also a problem. But sometimes, thinking too much about the problem is also a problem. Oh, I don't have a job, I don't have a job, I don't have a job. If that's what is burning us 24 hours a day, that will drain us. And even if we have to go for an interview, we'll be so worried, we'll not be able to perform properly. So you have to find the right balance where when we are facing a problem, our energy is used to deal with the problem and not deny the problem or be overwhelmed by the problem. So we deal with that material deprivation appropriately. But we just because we are material deprived doesn't mean that 24 hours we can work to deal with that material deprivation. So we, even amid that material deprivation, we can find time and energy to practice bhakti. And that can rejuvenate us. That can rejuvenate us. And then we can work better to deal with the material deprivation also. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta 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 B